And it is caught on the play by Cole. Foot race beats Johnson. He'll beat Hyde and he takes it in for six. Keelan Cole with a 40 yard catch and run touchdown. First touchdown. Singletary. And he corkscrews in for the touchdown. Third and goal at the four. Singletary looking for a block, and he got it from McKenzie, and he takes it in for six on a four-yard play. And the Bills are going to win the AFC East at home in front of their crowd for the first time at home they'll clinch since 1995. Then it was Don Maynard's turn. Maynard made a great over-the-shoulder catch 52 yards away, and the Jets were suddenly at the Raider 12. Namath refused to probe the defense. He went directly for a score. Seeing George Sauer covered, Namath slipped, regained his balance, and fired a rifle pass to Don Maynard through three defenders for the crucial touchdown of the game. Namath and Maynard have proved themselves as poised a combination under pressure as the AFL had ever seen. Welcome to the Underdog Jets podcast with Wayne Corbett and Robbie Sabo. Welcome back, Jets fans, to the Underdog Jets podcast with Wayne Corbett. We're here on this Monday night after the last game of the season, week 18, a tough one for the Jets. A historically tough one, feeling 53 yards of total offense. And listen, you know, Wilson threw for more than 53 yards, obviously, but it was the sacks that did him in. I think there was eight or nine sacks, I think nine in total. Buffalo feasted. So it was a rough one. But the story of the moment we'll open with is Don Maynard, who passed away. The news came on Monday at the age of 86. And one man who knew Don Maynard, who is in the same class, the same category as Don Maynard, is Wayne Corbett. Wayne, how are you tonight? I'm good. How are you doing? Pretty good. So you met Maynard. You knew him. Uh, I saw you posted a picture on Instagram and Twitter of you two. I don't know which event that was, but you two talked frequently at events, at gatherings, you know, remembering the legends. Uh, what are your first thoughts on, you know, the Jets' greatest all-time receiver? Oh, it's tough. It's a great loss for the Jets' uh organization yeah you know right after you know my rookie year and I started I got a chance to meet him uh, and just an honor to meet him I you know I idolized him and just uh, it's funny that he knew stuff about me and I was like this is Don Maynard you know what I mean and every year at the ring of honor or the, or the events I always we, me him and Wesley Walker always took a picture together and compared from the year before uh, I saw him at um the hall of fame enshrinement for Kevin Y which was a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, I know he's had health problems over the years, um, but he was hanging in there strong. And just the memories I have with him, just sharing stories with him and listening to him and, and him and name the talk and their camaraderie. I was always uh, envious of that. Uh, just, uh, and I got a chance to talk to them both together on, on the field for the 100th anniversary team. Yep. It's me, Don and, and Joe. And I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm like, this is absolutely <laughs> insane that I'm in a conversation with these two, but Maynard was special to the Jets. He was special to me. Yeah. Just a surreal moment, right? You probably were sitting there looking around like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, it's, it's, you know, surreal. Is Yeah. Good descriptor. He's a, he was a Southern boy Maynard, right? 
And uh, I, I heard through the years he had a really good sense of humor too. Is that is that correct? Yeah, if you you know if you got to know him a little bit, yeah, you know he's kind of kind of quiet, but uh, just a, definitely a, a character and one I, I cherish the memories with. Yeah, statistically speaking, I mean, you know, Jets fans, the Jets organization, Joe Nemeth it is a great portion of the Jets history, especially because of Super Bowl three, what that meant for the NFL with the two leagues merging, the guarantee. But Maynard, I mean, statistically speaking, is unbelievable. Uh, he, you know, he started, he was a giant first. His first year started with the Titans, was with the Jets from, you know, 1960 through 1972. That's a huge chunk of time. The one thing about him is he never missed games. You know, I posted a picture on Twitter and Instagram, just random. I happened to see it, you know, with a single bar face mask. He had a sort of a bloody mouth. It was tough to play back then. And he never missed games. So he was just a tough, tough, tough player. Yeah. You know, he said he didn't miss games and he did all this without gloves on too. True. Playing, playing in the New York weather and going all over. Um, and, and his his uh, statistics stand the test of time. I mean, he's still uh, statistically in the top of all the categories. And that's back when, you know, they just started throwing the ball. Yeah. Obviously, you know, Joe Namath came in and started chucking the ball around and that was his, his favorite receiver. But uh, yeah, if you go back and look at the best receivers of all time, he's definitely in that category. Yeah, if, uh, Jets ranks, he's first with 627 receptions. Number two is number 80, Wayne Corbett with 580. He's also first in yards, 11,000, uh, 11,732 total. He's just, he's one of the greatest of all time. And like you said, the 60s are not what they were today. Only a 14 game schedule. You know, the passing had opened up a little bit in that decade, but it's nothing compared today. And I think he's still, uh, where does he rank? 31st all time in receiving yards. That, that's an incredible mark. Yeah. And plus back then, you know, DBs could beat, beat you up all over the field, all the way down the field. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't as easy with the rules today. But like I said, you know, he's up there. You know, I know he's 30th and in, in statistically – and catches and stuff, but he's he's way up there in my mind as far as the best receivers of all time. Yeah, he's an incredible player, one of the greats, definitely uh, on the Jets' Mount Rushmore, which is a tough one to for fans to figure out. By the way, you got Namath, you got Maynard, you have um, Martin Curtis, you have Revis, you have Klecko, you Gastino, Tune, so many. But Maynard definitely deserves a spot. Yeah, I mean he's he's what I envision. You know what? Uh, when I think of a green and white, you know, the person, you know, the perfect person to symbolize it. Like you said, he played hard. You know, he got bloodied up, no gloves. You know, and uh, he made such a great career there. And I was just honored to follow in his footsteps. Absolutely. So, you know, the the news of Maynard came a day after the Jets loss, twenty seven to ten in Buffalo, capped off a four and thirteen season. Not the record you want to see, but you got to be able to see past that. You got to be able to see through that to see what they're building. Uh, Douglas spoke today. Everyone did their, you know, end of season pressers today. Douglas spoke. He, as he usually does, he doesn't give much, but he'll always put the responsibility on his shoulders. And he said, I have to do better. Um, any thoughts in terms of an overall grade before we get into the game, an overall grade on Salah, Douglas, and where this regime is headed? I think they did a great job. Obviously, the wins aren't there. But if you, like I said, we've talked about this. If you look at the draft class of this year, you know, Zach to Elijah, you know, Vera Tucker blocking the two Michael Carters and the other young guys, free agents and stuff like that. And the guys came in. I mean, Keelan Cole had a great catch. Corey Davis started strong. Um, and I just like what they've done, the direction they're going. And if you look, they got two picks in the first uh, top 10 picks in the, in yep. the next draft. Yep. And that's because of Joe Douglas and what he did in the moves he made. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying they're a lot, you know, they're not a lot of pieces away, you know, Becton was hurt all year. So I give him a good grade. I think Sal like kept the guys, you know, uh, in the fight, you know, it's easy when you're, you know, halfway through the season, three quarters and you're eliminated from the playoffs, but he kept them fighting. You know, I know the score didn't show up, but yesterday they showed up. And I listened to Salah on the, on the radio today. And like I said, they took responsibility for it. They said the guys played hard. Um, he said, uh, you know, 
it's tough as a head coach, as a defense coordinator, just to, all the things he has to do. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as being a head coach, to be an assist, you know, defense coordinator. But uh, I think he did a great job. And this is the first offseason in a long time. We're not talking about get a new coach, get a new GM, because yep. they're finally going to be there for a couple more years at least. Yeah, Sal, uh, he mentioned it this past week that he lost, what was it, 20 pounds? He lost 20 pounds this year. It, he and his family have not been – you know, when he got the job, he he bought a house or he's building a house and it wasn't ready in time. It was supposed to be ready in October and they still are not in that house. So imagine yeah. what he's gone through this year dealing with that. He was talking. I guess he's got seven kids. Yeah, he's got a lot. I don't know how many exactly, but he's got a lot. I think he said that the nine of them in, in a little two better par- two bedroom apartment. So uh, or whatever it is. So, yeah. uh, you know. It's uh it's tough to get adjusted when you're in that situation. I know his house is getting built, but like I said, this guy's gonna be around for a long time. I think I see them turning around. I see it doing quickly. And hopefully we have that longevity that other teams have. We can build and build and build every year and keep the same, you know, management intact. Yeah, it's uh and think about it from Zach Wilson's perspective too. This was his first year in away from Utah, basically. So having that period of adjustment is going to serve them well moving forward, I believe. Yeah. I mean, it's an adjustment for everybody, you know, especially, you know, like you said, you know, where Zach came from and where he at now, he handled it with the media, he handled it with the fans, you know, and that's all you can ask for from a young guy like that. And like I said, he started off slow, but I think he finished strong, um, but he's running for his life back there. Yes. He was. You know, there was a couple of alignment out, Beckton has been out all year. So, uh, you know, you can't blame him for having some negative plays and negative games, but all in all, I think, uh, like I said, the whole draft class was a success. Uh, agreed. And Jets fans should be really excited about this draft class too. They picked number four and 10. It's set in stone. Obviously the rest of the order isn't because of the playoffs. We'll see how that shakes out and the compensatory picks, which are rewarded, you know, during the free agency period, but they'll pick four and 10, which is excellent. Um, and as far as the game is concerned, Zach, you know, the stats are not great. They only had 53 yards of total offense. Wasn't pretty. Orchard Park, terrible weather. But the best defense in the league, the best cover uh, coverage defense in the league with McDermott. Uh, that touchdown, Wilson had to Keelan Cole. I think it was against a cover one robber. And Wilson sneaked it in there before Poyer, the safety who started too high, drove down. That was a pretty looking ball where he placed it. But for the most part, nine sacks, he was just running for his life, trying not to play hero ball, trying to do the right thing. And he just didn't have many options. No, it's tough when you're running for your life back there to, to yeah. make plays and try to make something out of nothing. So not a good way to end. Obviously, they played hard. And the week before with Tampa, would it have been nice to get that win? But a lot of it's learning process, you know, with the young guys. I think I was looking where the youngest – amount of uh, starch for rookies or whatever it was, what we did in the draft class and where these standings were um, for what they had and the injuries. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, I think they did a, a pretty good job. Um, yeah. A lot to build on. They need a whole off season with this group to kind of get, you know, everything going smoothly, but I'm optimistic. And I know other, other Jets fans are just as much. And, and I like to see that. Yeah, and the one thing I think this game should take away is that Berrios is a huge part of this offense because if you track the season, their offense really started exploding when the jet motion stuff and the orbit motion stuff was put in with Berrios because it really kept the defense honest, that edge honest. And if you can keep that play side, play side edge honest, you could do a lot between the tackles. Yeah, having Berrios going in the jet motion, getting the ball – you know, running, uh, you know, out routes, but, uh, you know, that opened it up for Michael Carter and, yeah. and the running back, certainly uh, with the cutback lanes and stuff like that. And yeah. I think with floor, you know, as the season went on, they got better and better, you know, more comfortable with what kind of game he wanted to call with the with Zach in there and what kind of personnel they had. So, uh, like I said, it's nice. We're not talking, we're not the Giants. We're not talking about yeah. the game getting replaced and head coach that nobody likes and this coordinator and that. Listen, I know they have two top 10 picks too, but it is much better to be a Jet fan than a Giant fan right now. Yes. Uh, it, what's going, what happened this year and what's going forward uh, in the future? Yeah, Gettleman retired. I, I think they're bringing back Joe Judge, but I'm not sure yet. I should double check that, but you're 100% correct. I mean, 
everything is solidified. There will always be non-believers out there because they've waited for so long, but they're few and far between. If you talk to Jets fans who really know what they're watching, they understood the kid quarterback had no chance. They understood the injuries. I mean, when you take out his top three weapons, who he feels most comfortable with more Barrios, Corey Davis, you don't have Becton, you don't have Fant, you know, the center uh, McGovern, it's an absurdity. So let's see what they do this off season. And uh, in terms of positions, do you have any preference in terms of what they should seek first? My, my, my thing is availability and football instincts over position. But uh, what does Wayne Corbett have to say about it? Um, I mean, they're set a quarterback. Yeah, well, they're not going to draft a backup. I certainly got a lot of veterans out there. Mike like White too. To you got Mike White too. With the Carter and Tevin Coleman and Ty Johnson, um, mm-hmm. you got to change your pace back. You know, you got a hard runner and quite a Carter. So, I think you know you could always use offensive line help. Um, get an edge rusher. I know we're young in the secondary, so there's some holes to fill. But uh, you can get some pretty, uh, you know, impactful guy, you know, two picks in, in the top 10. So, you know, we'll see what happens in free agency. What do they have, 70 million? Yeah, it's, it, it sounds about right. I mean, a lot of the sites say 55, but after the Shaq Lawson cut, it's going to be more. So, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So they're in a great position set up with the draft and, and salary caps. So um, I trust in, in Joe, I trust in Sal, I trust. So uh, they, they've given me no reason not to believe that they're going to get the job done. Yeah, uh, same here. And I, I think um, Spot Track has them at about sixty million, but there will be more space coming. So yeah. that number is pretty spot on. Yeah. Um, all in yeah. All, like I said, it's the wins weren't there, but they played hard. You know, and they won some games. You know, against some uh, good playoff teams. So uh, I am a. Uh, not satisfied not making the playoffs or winning championship, but uh, as far as where we were years past, you know, I like, I like our position. Yeah. And the injuries too. I mean, I know everyone has injuries, so it can never be an excuse, an official excuse, right. but it's a factor. You can't just wave it aside and say, Hey, everyone's injured. No, these guys were hammered again this year. Right. And so, that's what, yeah, you got the backups, but when you got young guys, young guys starting already, they're followed up by even younger guys. So uh, definitely need some depth. But um, like I said, I think they'll do a good job. And what do we have, nine or ten picks? Yeah, it sounds about right. I don't know the exact total, but, you know, knowing they have two firsts, two seconds, it's, you know, they're they're pretty wealthy there. Yeah. So let's just, let's just, you know, reminisce on how this year, the good things that happen kind of throughout the bad. And like I said, be optimistic going into the offseason. And Mosley too. Mosley played well after missing two years. You know, think about that. He was a tackling machine this year. I think he finished third or fourth in the league in tackles. So How you know they he have make the Pro Bowl. What he didn't make the Pro Bowl, right? How does he not? How does Barrios I, return? I don't know. Barrios should have made it. Mosley should have made it. I mean, I know a couple of guys were alternates, but that's that's absurd. That Barrios especially and Mosley. Yeah, I mean, every everywhere you look, he was he was coming downhill, and he hits, man. Yeah. I mean, he was killing guys, but uh, glad to have him back and healthy. And, um, you know, like I said, just keeping guys healthy and adding in and sprinkling a couple new guys. You know, AFC East is tough. AFC yes. East is really tough. You know, with the Bills and Pats are obviously the top. Miami had a great year. I can't believe they got rid of their head coach. Yeah, goals. I was going to ask you that. What do you think about that, getting rid of Flores? It reminds me of Mangini, to be honest, in 2009. I think Costello said the same thing. As me on Twitter, I think we tweeted it right around the same time. You know, Mangini did well with personnel, didn't have terrible seasons. One bad season out of three kind of makes me feel like a Mangini situation. Yeah. Well, I don't I don't know what they're thinking down there, but um, he's a young coach, fiery kind of guy. You know, they did great with what they had, you know, with the draft picks they had. So I'm not sure why they did that. I can't. Yeah. I'm not behind closed doors there. But um you know, there's still going to be teams that would be wrecking it, you know, in the Miami Dolphins. So uh, we got our workout cut out for us. So uh, hopefully we can get closer to the top next year in the AFC East and hopefully into the playoffs. And then one more rumor I'll spring on you here. There has been a lot of chatter about Calvin Ridley, the Falcons receiver who sat out this year. Yeah. Um, it's kind of mysterious still why he sat out, mental health concerns, which I don't think anyone would get on him for, but still it has to be a factor if trying to acquire him. You know, a lot of people are throwing out a second round and a third round or something like that, but you got to extend them. So, you know, what are your thoughts on a possible Ridley target? 
I've heard a couple of different names, but Ridley's solid guy. And he showed he can be a number one, you know, after Julio went to Tennessee. So, um, yeah, he's a great young talent. I always say you're going to have to give him a, a long-term deal. But um, I think they do need another playmaker. You know, yeah. what Corey brings in, uh, in, in Burials. I'm not sure what they're going to do with Crowder. So, yeah, it'd be great to add a guy like that. You know, he can run all the routes, the whole route tree. So, uh, yeah, we'd love to have him. Yeah, he's an excellent route runner. And you can't have too many good route runners in today's league. And, and you uh, see guys get injured and, you know, you right. need other guys to step in. Right. And any other guy we should throw out there for the Pro Bowl? George Fant. George Fant was tremendous this year. So, you know, he deserves recognition as well. Yeah. Well, you got other teams, the, you know, getting five, six, seven guys in. I think it's not right. To uh, I'm not saying one guy should every team should make it like in uh, like a baseball major league baseball, but I mean seriously, you got to look at some of these teams that have, you know maybe suffered you know a, a not successful season, but that doesn't right. mean they're not good enough to be in the Pro Bowl. Plus, plus the roster in the Pro Bowl is huge, so you know yeah. it's a lot easier to squeeze them in. So I agree, 100. Yeah. percent Um. Let's remind everyone that we're going to be doing the Wayne Corbett virtual meet and greet Q and A. We already have a, a pretty full list of applicants of people inquiring, but that doesn't mean you listening. If you're interested, if you want to ask Wayne a question, that doesn't mean you can't get in on it. Uh, visit jetsxfactor.com, search for the underdog jets podcast menu item in the menu under podcast. And we'll put the link in the description too, uh, below, you know, on iTunes, on YouTube, and inquire today because it's really going to be fun in two weeks on January 24th. And the promo code. And the promo code too. Yeah. Discount code, promo code 80, get a discount. And by using that, it, it signals to us that you're really interested. It'll, it'll put you above the others in terms of getting your question on Zoom and meeting Wayne face to face. Yeah. Like so we've come up with some great ideas going forward. Um, now that I'm involved with Jets X Factor, so the Q&A is the first thing. Uh, we're going to have a memorabilia giveaway, sweepstakes, anything, you know, stuff for the fans, um, you know, giving away autographs and stuff like that. But the Q&As are going to be great. You know, ask me some questions, you know, whatever you want to know. Yep. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the first one. Yeah, one of them we talked about before was this pregame snack. I'm not going to give it away. Maybe someone will ask it. But that one blew me away. I got to be honest at first. Lots to talk about, lots Ew. of behind the scenes stuff, maybe some stuff that people never read in the newspapers when I was playing. So yep. I'm looking forward to it. It should be a lot of fun. A couple of Maynard jokes here and there. Well, we'll get to all of it. Yeah. All right, folks, Jets fans, end of the season for the Jets, but that doesn't mean it's the end of the season for us. We'll be back next week and definitely on January 24th. Uh, so stay tuned to Jets X Factors Twitter, Wayne's Twitter, Instagram and get all the news and all the happenings from there. Wayne, take us home. Sounds great. It was a great podcast. Love talking about my Jets. Uh, they said Don Maynard will be missed. I mean, he meant a lot to the you know, Jets organization and, and the fan base. So, um, you know, just pray for his family and look forward to talking to you next week. Rest in peace, Don. Jets fans, until next time. All right. Take care.